you shouldn't have to think about your disk allocation or disk storage, right? It should just scale with you and you should in fact pay for what you use. So that's actually what we do with TimeScale. Hi, this is Yosef Bhartia and welcome to another episode of TFR Let's Talk. And today we have with us Mike Friedman, co-founder and CTO of TimeScale. Mike, great to have you on the show. Nice to be here. I will talk a bit about uh, a broader picture when it comes to data databases is that uh, if you look at modern, it could be cloud native or Kubernetes world. Talk a bit about what are the challenges that uh, folks are facing because folks have moved to, uh, when you look at Kubernetes, uh, cloud native production, uh, of course, it's very easy to get up and running. Uh, storage is cheap, networking, of course, the problem solved. But when it comes to data and databases, what are the major challenges that you see uh, enterprises or uh, even startups are facing today? So if you you know think about where a lot of you know Kubernetes and different Elastic services started out, it really started by the shift of how we want to build how we want to build stateless applications. It was kind of the the next generation of how we build web tiered, where you know that was focused a lot of times. So you could spin up services, spin down services, and the key idea there was that they didn't need to worry about state because all that state was in our databases. But now we have the problem of we actually want to build now more robust and reliable databases. So you had all this infrastructure, which is great at building super elastic stateless services, but it didn't solve what are really the underlying infrastructure for building modern applications, which is which are databases. And so, you know, why does this happen? This happens because you know, we're building, you know, users and customers, whether or not our business or consumers are really demanding more and more from our applications. We want them to be faster, more engaging, more personalized. And what was great is that we have these big hardware trends, you know, uh, Moore's Law and Kreider's Law and all these things that compute and storage were getting cheaper. But the question is, how does that build, how does that bring greater, you know, better productivity to developers so they could build better and more engaging applications. Um, I think that's really what ha happened. You see this new uh, age of very interesting databases and databases companies emerge. I think TimeScale is a great, greatest example of that, where we're really thinking about how do we re-architect the database for modern applications. Um, and so what do I mean by modern application? You know, it's data intensive. Um, there's lots of ingest happening. There's events from your product and usage, metrics from device or sensors, other real-time data feeds. And then you want to build these applications that use all this data to provide you know, live analytics or live data that's available to query immediately. You know, this is not about BI reporting, which you thought about a lot of databases. That's, that's often a different data team. Um, this is about how do we make, how do we enable developers who are building applications on top of this data? And so, you know, that's really what TimeScale focuses on. How do we, we're built, we think of ourselves as Postgres++, um, Postgres re-architected for modern applications. Uh, we make it, you know, easy, fast, scalable, worry-free, and cost-effective. And so that, you know, if you really want to worry about, you, you know, if you're, if you're today, you're, you're, you're trying to use Postgres or MySQL or maybe Mongo or other things, and you're you know, running into performance or scalability or cost reasons, that's how, you know, moving to uh, time scale again, built on Postgres, but more for this modern applications and modern cloud. Now, if you look at, once again, databases, Postgres is a great example. I mean, uh, most of these databases have been around for a very long time. Uh, almost all of them, these predate uh, the cloud, cloud native totally. world. Uh, talk a bit about what are the limitations that, you know, these databases don't have. Um, and once again, how time scale enters the picture and try to you know, tackle some of those challenges? Yeah, so I think there's two aspects of it. One is, what is it about these database architectures themselves? Is that, is that what we want? What assumptions do they make about the infrastructure? You know, when they were designed initially for, you know, running on a single server versus running in the cloud? And what about the workloads have changed? And because I think it's really all of those, it's that the deployment models have changed and the workloads have changed. Uh, and that's where kind of time scale of folks. In fact, I think we're actually more unique compared to a lot of people playing this space because we have teams that both extend the internals of the database as well as do a lot of uh, really amazing engineering around the database and the infrastructure itself. So 
you know, the interesting thing about a database, when we launch Timescale, our launch blog post, this was 2017, is when boring is awesome. And what we mean by that is we started by saying, what about the cloud? And it's stateless. We want to scale, but it sits on this database. And the thing is, if you're a developer, um, you want to focus on your application. You don't really want to think about your database. You want your database to give you everything you want but you want it to just work and you want it to be worry-free. It's kind of like your Wi-Fi. Like if your Wi-Fi is amazing, you never think about it. The times you think about your Wi-Fi is generally when you're really unhappy with it. Um, And so I think that's been this tension in this industry, right? It's like we have databases take a long time to get right. You know, the, 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 the thing that people say is it takes at least a decade to make a robust database because it's, it's okay, you can, you can get the first eight, 60 or 80 or 90% right, but it's the last 10 or 20%. Every you know, 99 to 99.9 bit of reliability takes another order of magnitude of effort because it's all the long corner cases. And so you know, Postgres itself is a database with its roots back in the 1980s or 1990s in academic work, but it's really been an amazing community effort of you know, millions of person hours of work to get to the stage it is. And of course, it's built general, very general purpose. And because it's so community driven, it's by construction, very general purpose, because it really wants to run anywhere, right? It run, wants to run on a Raspberry Pi, in your old rack, in the cloud, whatever. Um, and, you know, they make various decisions about, you know, they want to generalize it when, um, as kind of a time scale, and where we focused on offering a managed offering, we could become much more opinionated for the type of deployments and the type of use cases that we're focusing on. So, you know, coming back to what I talked about with a modern application, you know, one of the things we noticed is we started, we call this time series, but it's really much more broader than that. It's time series, it's events, it's analytics, where you have these streams of data. Well, there's different ways you'd even construct data, you know, data structures inside your database if you're looking at workloads that are append, append mostly, as opposed to workloads which are constantly updating the same records again and again. And so while we build on top of Postgres, some of our core is implemented what's called as an extension, but it's really we have hooks throughout the Postgres software that we line a layer on top of that. So we support all of what Postgres does, that's why I call it plus plus, but then all add all these new capabilities designed for what these type of modern applications are. You know, do this automated partitioning that's transparent. We have this amazing native compression, this hybrid row columnar storage, um, soon vectorized execution, these things of, um, you query the same thing again and again. So we build up what we call continuous aggregates, which are uh, basically materialized views that are constantly kept real time based on any changes you make to the database. All which is, again, how you serve modern applications. So I say that by saying you take this amazing thing that people are trust with all of their production workloads, and then you build on top of it and extend it for the type of use cases that people are trying to build today, especially those that are customer facing, as well as in type of cloud environments, which we, which we hadn't had before. As you were saying that uh, developers should not get overwhelmed with things like databases. In general, you know, these developers should focus on writing business application and should not have to worry about a lot of this plumbing. That's the whole idea of the cloud in the beginning. You know, hey, you know what? We we take care of your LAMP stack. You don't have to worry about Debian or CentOS or RHEL. You just focus on that. But now if you look at Kubernetes or cloud, you're spending most of your resources on actually managing them than actually uh, focusing on business applications. I totally agree. And let me, let me give you an example. Like, And you think about something like RDS. RDS is really like, it was just a lift and shift, lift and shift, right? They took Postgres, they just run it in a VM, and that's kind of what RDS is. Um, and what some of the things that we're doing in the cloud, for example, is that, you know, you shouldn't have to think about your disk allocation or disk storage, right? It should just scale with you, and you should, in fact, pay for what you use. So that's actually what we do with time scale. Like, we worry about making sure that you have enough storage underneath, but, you know, you just write as much data you need, and, in fact, I talked about compression before, you know, we see crazy numbers of 90, 95% compression on our data um, because we use actually algorithms designed for, you know, the types of data. If you have, you know, we're actually 
compressing different types of data differently to get those amazing rates. But you know, you just store the amount of data that you use, and that's all you pay for. And another thing that we just, for example, launched, again, this is what you could do when you're cloud-focused, is that if you think about this data that you're constantly writing into your database, you know, you probably use the, the recent stuff a lot. You probably query it a lot. You probably even update it. As the data starts getting older, especially maybe your data from a year ago, you still want it around to build analytics on top of, to be able to occasionally do ad hoc queries against, but you're probably not changing it too quickly. So in Timescale, we allow you to transparently tier that across you know, fast SSDs as well as S3. That's all transparent to you. You just look like you have this giant table with a policy on it. You don't actually think about that. But under the covers, we take your SQL queries. Some of that get executed in main memory on, on standard disk. Some of that gets transparently pushed down uh, into S3. And again, it gives this bottomless management experience for the developer where they just get focused on their business applications and let all that, leave that, all that complexity to us, but then reap some of those cost savings that we're able to pass on as well. As you're talking about some of these databases, they predate a lot of these cloud and technology, but a lot of uh, new technologies, new databases, they have emerged in, which are like born in the cloud native world. Um, of course, uh, we have started talking about Kubernetes in production like one or two years ago. Talk about uh, some of those databases, uh, which, you know, once again, like at the very early stages, like uh, as you were saying, one of the biggest difference between application and databases is database, databases or data is 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 the actual asset of a company application can go and come back you know but the data that is what the the most critical piece there and that's why it's important so talk a bit about uh, when uh, looking at some of those latest technologies what are the risks risk associated with them? Because once again, when we talk about cloud, we are not talking about a stateless workload. We are talking about stateful workloads. You know? And you know, like you said, I mean, what we are, the, the customers that we serve and the users that we serve, you know, are building their production apps on this. You know, when we, we have customers where when we stop, you know, we serve gaming companies. If our database isn't available, the game stops working for their millions of users. We serve IoT and manufacturing companies. If we're down, their manufacturing line actually stops. Um, and so you can imagine that you need to you need to really care about operations and stability. Um, not only just the database and how we engineer, but you know we have um, support and ops in APAC and EMEA in North America because we practice you know round the clock follow the sun models of all of our cloud infrastructure. But back to your question, you know. When we think about that, I, I start by saying when boring is awesome. And, you know, it takes a long time to build a mature database. And I think that was something that was somewhat unique about our approach is how do we make it Postgres++ plus plus, as opposed to this, I think, false dichotomy, which says that either you have to use the old option, which is not modern, and doesn't fit modern needs, or you have to start from scratch and you know, build on top of a really nascent technology. And I think when you start from scratch, you, know, you could build some early performance results that look good, but I think those solutions generally lack the maturity and stability and, and you know, operational maturity and tooling and developer tooling and developer ecosystem um, as well-established options. You know, I think lately you start seeing a lot of companies who become you know, Postgres compa wire format compatible, but all that means is they speak a network protocol. That says, some, not, that says nothing about their internals where it takes years to actually, you know, iron out those details. And so I think that leads to a lot of unexpected bugs, performance issues, even data loss um, that potentially disrupts business operations. Um, and I think it's also that, again, it's not just the risk, it's that with a lot of newer, newer databases, the, the, the problem with all infrastructure is that, you know, people share the same 60, 80 percent of use cases, but you always have that last 20 percent. And the problem is everybody's last 20 percent is a little bit different. And so it's really that amount of maturity that, you know, time scales through through Postgres that we get this breadth of features and functionality that is powerful for our users, not just when they start. But as they scale their, you know, their business and their applications, as they want to do more and more with their database. So I think, you know, it leads to, 
you know, performance stability, it leads to perform, uh, you know, engineering productivity over time and also helps kind of reduce business risks when you could kind of modernize something like, like a, an amazing database like Postgres. Why Postgres? Let me start by saying is like, you know, I, I'm, that was one bet that we were so confident of when we started. And I actually think if you look at the, the trends over the last five years, there's all these metrics. It actually is that Postgres, this database that started late 80s, early 90s, that is actually today like almost the fastest growing database. And it has really caught this, you know, reemergence as the database that I think developers are going towards. So I think that decision we made when we started about, you know, six, you know, six, seven years ago, uh, that is totally one that I am very happy we made. And it was it never really came in doubt. You know, I, I think that there's really, like I said, you know, uh, stability, feature function. But, you know, when you think about more, I mean, Mongo and, and Influx, which you just mentioned, are both you know, more of NoSQL databases, um, you know, they really kind of, you know, generally fall down. You know, there's, there's, there's no free lunches. You know, you have to uh, actually think about, you know, it's, it's good to think about data modeling a little bit uh, when you think about building robust uh, applications. Um, but, but really, it's, it's the power of SQL that we found really um, important. In fact, the, the backstory of Timescale is when we started out, we weren't initially a, time, a, a, a database company and focusing on time series. We actually were building a platform for IoT, for sensor data. And as you can imagine, IoT generates a lot of sensor data, which is time series. And we initially were looking at some of the open source offerings that offer time series databases. And some offered like, you know, metrics. I'm going to store my device metrics. But what's Important about your data is not just your metrics, but also information about the devices generating them, the business data, the metadata around those metrics that are emerging. So what we had to do, and in fact, what a lot of what we also hear a lot of customers who are using these not, you know, not relational offerings like Postgres, but other things, is they deploy both a time series only database and a relational database like Postgres. And then you, what you realize is whenever you want to answer questions, you need to move those joins to application space. So if you want to ask a new questions about your data, you can't just query your database. You need to deploy new application code that then pulls this data from two different databases and then joins it in application space. So it not only is that bad for performance, it's bad for productivity, it's operationally complex. And so the reason we actually started building TimeScale, TimeScale DB on Postgres is it solved those needs. It gave us the SQL we want. It gave us the performance we want. It gave us that operational simplicity. And it basically stored both of our time series events and analytical data, as well as our business and metric data. And we see that across basically all of our customers as well. As we are talking about you know, these databases and technologies, I also want to talk a bit about the cultural aspect. When we look at, you know, we talk about DevOps, DevSecOps, SREs, platform engineering. A lot of disciples are there. Uh, a lot of processes are there. What kind of trend you're seeing when it comes to data databases? Uh, you're like, hey, you know, yes, we do need a organization-wide approach because once again, as you said, you know, if the database is down or something goes, that's you know when everything is down. Uh, sure. Or you're like, no, we don't need that. Uh, companies, you know, they are doing fine. Or you're like, no, we do need a culture. Where you know developers or teams are looking at data databases a bit differently. Well, I think two things. One is not surprising. We view that kind of data is the lifeblood of a lot of these applications. So obviously, um, care and maturity needs to be taken when um, building applications. Although I think part of the role of of companies like TimeScale is to handle a lot of that robust operations for for users again, so they could focus on their applications. Um, but I think that, you know, one of the other trends that we see is that when people talk about databases, they, you know, there's a lot of old terms that they use like OLTP and OLAP and HTAP and, and all of these things that are meant to describe the workloads. And some of those things became popularized, frankly, around because of benchmarks, like industry standard benchmarks that existed, TPCC and TPCH and all these things. But I actually don't think that's the right way to think about it. I don't think it's an OLTP workload or an OLAP workload or something else. Um, what we see is that what, what really differentiates this is who the users are and what purpose the, that data is being used for. And so we see a big distinction 
between developers, often product teams, line of businesses, whatever you want to call them, who are building applications, a lot of times external facing, sometimes even internal facing, but they're building applications on top of a database. And that database has to be operationalized, operational, it's, it's productized, it, it serves you know, the, core, the core use of that data. And the opposite, which are often data teams or centralized data infrastructure, which you see more technologies like traditional data warehousing or data lakes or lake houses or whatever they're, the, the amount of, there's also a, a growth there, but that is a way where you bring together all these disparate sources across your organization, some product data, some sales data, across all these ETL jobs, and to have a centralized view, but that is often used for things like reporting, analysis, now model training, but not really to serve and build applications on top of. And so when I think about that division, it's not about OLTP versus OLAP, because again, a lot of the data that serves modern applications are analytical in nature. It's part of the applications. But I think it's more about, do you serve developers or do you serve data teams? And I think that is the type of division that we're seeing. And different solutions are going to be done, done, done differently. For data teams, they often look for single centralized solutions that are used across the organization because the value there is with centralization. For product teams and for, for developers, they often have more flexibility that they want the best solution for the application that they're developing. So it could be that timescale is the best solution for a number of those, while there are certain, certain applications that even different parts of the organization's building where other databases are perhaps better suited for them as well. Can you share uh, some use cases or users who are relying on time scale uh, solutions? So we actually, you know, serve people across, uh, you know, a really horizontal set of use cases, anywhere from um, energy uh, to kind of uh, financial and crypto to manufacturing and IoT, um, transport, logistics, gaming, music, security, observability. And so it's anywhere from you know, the Fortune 500 like HP and Warner uh, and other modern companies like Uber and Coinbase to kind of car companies like Northvolt, renewable companies like building, like uh, uh, car companies like Lucid or renewables like Northvolt building the battery tech for, for Daimler. Um, and to everywhere from like gaming startups to, you know, IoT sensors um, and, and everywhere in between. So, it's a, a great combination of, of you know, major enterprises to the smallest startups. But again, the interesting thing about modern applications is you could have a 10-person startup dealing with terabytes of data. And so we have people come, small companies bring gigabytes, and small companies bring tens or hundreds of terabytes, um, all in the interest of serving these type of modern applications. Mike, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, talk about time scale and, of course, some of the challenges that are there. Thanks for those insights. And I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me.